Okay. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, of course, thanks for, for being here to listen to, to me uh, rabbit on about fish. So today I'm going to be discussing um, uh, sort of uh, an inquiry into the mechanisms by which animals influence one another when they're in collectives, social groups, or, or just groups generally, um, and taking this from a, a sort of animal behaviorist um, and uh, evolutionary perspective. Um, and so to begin with, I'll just show you um, no, uh, a video here. Uh, this is a video that I took uh, while snorkeling out the front of the Adriatico um, guest house. Um, in, in fact, right under the sign that says you're not allowed to snorkel there, um, which I saw coming out. Um, but it, it, it uh, not only is a beautiful uh, location, but it also encapsulates here in this collective, this group of fish, one of the fundamental questions that we're all really interested in um, when studying collective systems, which is the question of how one of the entities in this system, in this group, is influencing the probability of a behavioral output in any of the other entities. Um, and so a fundamental aspect of that question um, is, is both are there universal rules by which all animals are interacting and obeying? Or are there deviations and differences amongst the rules that are being used by members of these groups and collectives? And so that's the question that I'm gonna be dealing with uh, today, asking the question, if there's a behavioral output by entity A, what is the effect it has on entity B, and how is that effect realized? Um, and so looking at this question of therefore collective or social influence, uh, there are many ways this can be manifested, and I'm gonna deal with three of those uh, today. The first is that if there are different individuals within these groups or collectives, they may be doing fundamentally different things. The behaviors themselves are different, and so their effect on the collective is therefore different. Alternatively, different individuals may be doing the same things in the sense that the kinematic signature of behavior, for instance, is conserved, but these things have a different functional effect in the network, in the group that they exist, or indeed salience, so there may be no observable difference in the behavioral output, but the way the information is processed uh, may be different. And uh, alternatively, uh, the different individuals are doing exactly the same things, and these things have equivalent functional effects, but they operate on different spatial scales, and so therefore may manifest in different um, emergent or collective outcomes. I'm gonna look at that uh, in three different contexts. The first is what I would call a derived context, which is an experimental lab-based context in which we know very much about what we're putting into the system and what we're trying to measure coming out of the system. The second is a natural context in, in the wild, in my case in Lake Tanganyika in Africa, where we are not modifying the system very much, um, but we're observing how the system responds to its, its natural uh, contexts. And finally, an evolutionary context, which is a comparison across species when maybe the rules by which they have interact or by which they interact have evolved and changed over evolutionary time so that we can then uh, interpret or interrogate these different uh, modes of interaction. So we'll start with these derived contexts. Um, and so this uh, set of experiments, I'm just making sure you can see, you can, um, focuses around this group of cichlids uh, called Estatotilapia bertoni, um, an emerging model in, in social neuroscience, a very useful system because it has a very strong social hierarchy, um, a social hierarchy that's manifested not only in behavior, but in phenotypic markers of dominance. Uh, and so dominant males in these systems are brightly colored, uh, they're aggressive, they hold territories, and they're reproductive. Subordinate males um, are not colored, so they show none of these uh, sort of morphological markers of dominance, um, and they're non-aggressive, um, and they don't hold territories, but importantly, males switch uh, frequently between these two states. And so you have the ability to interrogate the behavior of a male, um, both in the dominant state and in the subordinate state. And if you create a social network, um, an interaction network in this case, um, of these uh, systems, you see that the dominant males are, are very uh, central and important nodes. They're highly connected nodes in these networks. That's because they're attacking uh, other males, they're fighting, they're displaying, they're performing courtship to females. And then you have the subordinate males out here um, that are peripheral nodes in these networks. In some senses, you may consider these unimportant nodes. And so we can then ask the question, if we place information or some kind of um, seed uh, into one of these networks, we can then ask the question, is there a difference in the way this information propagates through these networks based on the, the dominance position of uh, the, uh, the seed of, of that information? 
And this gets us to the question of how are the, the different uh, types of males, in this case the dominant and subordinate male, influencing the behavior of others in their network and, and altering emergent uh, uh, outcomes at the level of the group. Very similar to what we saw um, uh, in Lucy Aplin's talk uh, yesterday. And so the basic uh, premise here is because we want to keep it very uh, controlled, is we don't want these animals doing uh, a range of ecological tasks, we want them to do one thing, and in that case it's a simple association learning task where they learn to discriminate uh, between a, a, a yellow and a blue light, which indicates food. And so there's no initial response, importantly, from these animals. They do have a sensory bias towards red, uh, seemingly not yellow. Um, and so they show no uh, initial response. But over time, they come to learn that one of these colors um, is positively rewarded, um, which is indicated by a color change here that you can't see. Um, but then we uh, take these individuals uh, at different social ranks. So again, here's the dominant and the subordinate uh, males. We also included females in this design, but they turns out they have quite a strong hierarchy um, within the females that we cannot interrogate easily. So I won't talk about too much uh, on the female side today. And then we take these individuals that now know this association and we put them into a new group of naive fish and ask the question, how quickly does this group of naive fish come to learn this association task, given that they now have a social demonstrator of different ranks? Otherwise, these groups are equivalent, uh, except for the, the social rank of the demonstrator. And this was done when I was a poor postdoc before I came uh, to, to the Max Planck and Ian Cousins uh, uh, department. Um, so it looks a bit ghetto, but you'll have to excuse me. Uh, here you're seeing um, two uh, lights come on, and here is the informed individual. So this fish knows the association, and you see that the other fish are afraid uh, of, the, of the condition uh, and don't show a response. The group then comes to generalize about the, the light meaning food, but the, there's no consensus within the group, so they, they don't um, know which color. And then finally, we see a very strong um, uh, outcome at the level of the group where they all know this association very, very well. And so the basic question is how quickly do each of these groups come to this uh, informed state um, where they're all moving towards the queue prior to the reward being dispensed? Now, if we were being naive or I was to present you with a straw man argument, which I never would really uh, stand behind, you might argue that information should travel along these network edges as a function of their edge weight, right? So the, the, the dominant males would be the best informants because they're the best connected within their groups, certainly in, uh, in the structure of this behavioral network. Uh, and so we can then go and ask that question and uh, ask how quickly do each of these groups learn and so uh, this baseline rate is a naive group. So they learn in about 20 exposures uh, to the stimulus. And what you're seeing is that there's evidence of social facilitation here. So a demonstrator in the group does increase the, the rate at which the group learns this association. Interestingly though, here is the dominant male, the line of the groups that had a dominant male with the information. Uh, and although there is a significant uh, increase in learning, the important aspect is that it's the subordinate males or the groups with subordinate male uh, uh, demonstrators, or, uh, or at least, uh, if it's not an active demonstrator role, at least uh, with the information seated at the demonstrator, at the subordinate, uh, that learn far quicker. And so the question then is, how could this be true when these subordinate males are so peripheral in their networks? Well, the answer, of course, is probably that we've got the wrong network, right? We have a behavioral interaction network which is dominated by aggressive displays, and aggressive interactions, and it's unlikely to be the same kind of network over which information transfers uh, effectively. And so this can be uh, uh, relatively easily seen here. So I'm not going to tell you which animal here is the dominant animal, um, but I think it may become quite apparent quickly um, which animal is uh, the one that's chasing um, and, uh, and holding uh, the territory. And if it's not clear, it's this fish number eight. And so if we just look at this video here, it's uh, quite obvious in a sense as to why this might be a very poor um, effector of change, um, at least in this association learning task in this group. Um, two things to notice, of course, one is that uh, this animal is chasing all of the other fish. The other is that generally speaking, it seems to be further away from them and, and less connected in other kinds of networks. And so then we can interrogate those other kinds of networks and so here is a spatial connectivity network which just describes how close these dominant individuals are to the rest of the group. Um, and what you're seeing here is the, the, the dominant male. Um, and so it's, uh, the, the, the color of the lines indicates a further distance uh, away, but that's better represented here. 
Um, and so you're seeing that the average inter-individual inter distance between the dominant male and all other individuals in the group is far greater. Okay, so although it's behaviorally better connected, spatially it's very poorly connected. If we then also look at a visual connectivity network, how much uh, each fish can see of each other fish, we see also that the dominant male, this is now a different group where the dominant is number 10, is very poorly connected as well. And so not only are they further away from this individual, but they're seeing it less. And so there's far less opportunity uh, for the visual information of this rapid movement towards the, the, uh, uh, the stimulus um, to be uh, recognized and, uh, and perhaps um, encode a behavioral change. Finally, what's also important is uh, if you look here at the response to the, to the learning task, you see it's characterized behaviorally by this rapid swim towards the light, yeah, before the food is dispensed. Now compare that behavior to the behavior of a dominant male, sorry, never work with children or animals, okay, um, we see that the dominant male is frequently performing behaviorally similar, similar uh, uh, cues, right? So it's dashing around the tank all the time. And so there's a potential that the signal to noise ratio is also different for dominant males and subordinate males. Subordinate males are never swimming around uh, at this rapid uh, pace. And if they do, it's probably a very unusual uh, behavior for them and therefore stands out. Um, and we can look at that numerically, and so here's uh, the average speed at which they approach uh, the, the, the light stimulus, and here in red are all the times the dominant male in this group uh, made these acceleration bursts that were faster uh, or around as fast as those dashes towards the light cue, and so you see very many instances of, uh, of this behavior, and then if we compare that to a subordinate male here in blue, we see only four instances uh, of a similar behavior, and also that all of those instances were coincident with being chased, in fact, by the dominant male. They weren't spontaneous, they were a response to the dominant male's um, behavior. And so here we're seeing, of course, that the, uh, the, 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 the effect that these dominant males have on the behavioral change in their group members is uh, very different to subordinate males as a function of the kinds of behaviors and the scale over which uh, they perform these behaviors. We can actually go in and validate also uh, the salience of these cues by looking at the neural encoding uh, of uh, the social um, stimuli, um, asking the question, for instance, in the, in the areas of the brain that process fear in the fish, in this case, the basolateral amygdala homologue, we can ask, is there elevated activity when they're seeing these kind of behavioral cues coming from subordinate or dominant males? Um, and the answer is we don't know, um, but uh, we're trying to get to that point. We do have data showing that, of course, when they learn the cue, they have lower activity um, in, in these fear processing regions and other parts of the brain as well, but it's not clear if this is a cause or an effect of this difference in learning rate. Okay, um, and so then we can now move into natural contexts. Because, of course, in their, in their natural environment, in the, in the conditions in which they've evolved, fish are not learning or are not tuned to, to do, do these kind of uh, discrimination tasks. Um, they have a very different set uh, of, of uh, rules. Um, the four Fs of biology, as we talk about it in undergraduate course, um, fighting, fleeing from predators, um, feeding, and reproduction. Um, and so we're going to now, now look at this system here, um, which is uh, Lake Tanganyika and Cichlid, called uh, Lamprologus calypterus, and a very interesting system. And so this is wild footage, and uh, this fish employs a collective foraging strategy by which it overwhelms the defenses of territory holders. So here you're seeing one territory holder um, attacking these groups as they come in, but by sheer force of numbers, they overwhelm that territory defense and are able to feed inside these territories, yeah? Um, and so uh, they, they transition between three more or less uh, behavioral states. These are juvenile animals, so they're not doing any reproduction, and they're not uh, um, defending territory, so they're not really fighting very much. So their, their whole mode of life at this uh, life history stage boils down to, um, to avoiding predators and finding food. Yeah? And so if you watch this video, you'll see these behavioral states um, re relatively clearly. Here, of course, we're feeding and getting attacked by predators. Um, then they will 
enter into a movement phase, which is driven by some proportion of individuals uh, starting to, to, to move. Then again, they'll enter this feeding phase, which is characterized by this um, disordered, um, unpolarized state where they're uh, making small movements. And then it again transitions into this, uh, this directed movement phase here, um, where they're off now looking um, for something else to do. And so using this system, we can go in and ask and, and, and look at uh, the, the, both the collective level uh, behaviors and also the, the behaviors of the individuals and ask uh, what the link is between these, these states and the transitions amongst these states as a function of what the individuals within these groups are doing. Also, of course, as a function of what's happening externally. One thing I do want to point out um, here is that in, in a movement like this, if you watch this, this group for about 20 or 30 minutes, you're going to get about one or two of these predator or, or territory holder attacks on the system every minute. Um, so it's a very high density uh, of, of, um, of interactions and, and occurrences of, of very interesting behavior in these natural systems. Now, of course, tracking uh, in these natural systems is, is very difficult. Um, well, well, let's just summarize what I just said, which is that we have these three broad states, swimming, which is a, a very poor sort of behavioral classifier. A recent paper has just shown there are, um, with a machine learning approach, 13 modes of swimming in zebrafish larvae. Um, we can also have fleeing or being attacked, uh, as, I, as I demonstrated in the, in the video. Oops and then these feeding swarms. Now, of course, this is not an exhaustive list of the behaviors, and that's kind of the point. We want to characterize what behaviors there are and how the transitions amongst these behaviors are manifested. Okay, but, but on to tracking. Of course, in, in natural systems, uh, it can be very challenging to track these individuals, um, but that's been the, the challenge and, and the goal um, we've set ourselves. And so here we have one of these groups in the wild. What we do is we catch an entire group of about 200 individuals. We affix these barcodes to them, um, which allow us to track every single uh, individual and also maintain their identity, or at least that was the idea. Uh, and then uh, uh, with camera arrays uh, above them, as we swim with scuba with an array of uh, 10 or 12 GoPros uh, above them, filming these very large schools of up to 200 individuals, we can track uh, everything that's happening amongst them. Now, interestingly, uh, initially we did design this, this experiment with these barcodes in mind, um, but you know, this is the middle of Africa and, and things go wrong. And as it turns out, we, we couldn't reliably uh, detect these barcodes in the same way uh, that we intended, which was um, with some software developed by Jake Graving, one of uh, Ian Cousins' PhD students. So instead, we trained uh, machine learning models uh, to recognize the, these tags and even to pull out the IDs um, from the information encoded on those tags. Um, but what we're ultimately moving towards is entirely untagged systems. So here's uh, some experiments uh, of mine with spiders showing um, our ability, if, if I can show you. Nope. Ah, here we go. Um, to use these, um, these neural net approaches uh, to, to detect uh, individuals in very, very complex visual scenes. So this is what we're moving towards as well in the fish, uh, entirely unmanipulated um, approaches to tracking wild animals. Um, from these tracks, we then uh, use behavioral decomposition approaches, and I won't go too far into these, of course, because I think we're all relatively familiar with them, um, to, to uh, create maps of the entire behavioral space of all the individuals within these groups, um, and, uh, and of course, the group state itself. But just to briefly uh, discuss that, we, we look at these tracks that they take through the world, we take uh, points within these tracks, um, which are parameterized uh, in highly dimensional space, depending on what kinds of behaviors we're feeding into the model, and also the time windows we're using uh, to populate those. And then we ask the question, um, how similar are some areas or some points within this behavioral track to others? And the idea being that you should get these clusters of different behavioral states um, in an unsupervised and agnostic uh, manner. Now, of course, we also use supervised approaches um, for this machine learning, um, uh, but what I'll talk about here is, is our unsupervised stuff. And the kinds of parameters we feed in are, are kinematic signatures um, based on, on the motion um, and, uh, and uh, well, the behavioral motion uh, of each animal. Um, and so here you're seeing quite a clear signature um, in the green fish here of that uh, characteristic driving display that it did. Um, and so the point is here that we can really pull out um, with, with some of these parameters very, uh, very powerful signatures of the kinds of behaviors uh, that they're performing. Okay, and so then we can 
feed these uh, parameters into these models. Um, here we have five parameters. Average speed, average positive acceleration, average negative acceleration, um, absolute turning angle, and trajectory directedness, just a measure of the path tortuosity. And here they're, they're, we're seeing how well they contribute to each one of these, um, these uh, classes. And so here we're using um, uh, dimensionality reduction with one-dimensional T-SNE space. Many of you are probably familiar with the two-dimensional T-SNE space. Um, this is an argument uh, that I had nicely uh, the other day with Gonzalo about which is the best approach here. Um, and uh, I'm open to all of these discussions, this being a very uh, new and emerging way of understanding behavior. Uh, so then we can take these, uh, these behavioral categories that the model uh, spits out, and we can map them onto the track of the entire motion of these groups as they move through the world, and then start to ask, are these A, reasonable behavioral categories? Do they map to something we can observe and understand and quantify? And B, uh, ask about relationships between the behaviors of one individual um, and the group. And so as a ground truth, um, we can identify already some quite uh, apparent behavioral states, um, which are easy to interpret. So here we have one of these feeding swarms, um, which is characterized, again, by, by low velocity, um, by low degree of polarization, um, and short uh, um, st stochastic sort of movements. Um, and then we have these, these times when the group is attacked. And so they're going from one of these relatively uh, normal or relaxed uh, swimming uh, modes into an increase in acceleration and directedness um, as they're attacked by one of these predators or territory holders from the rear of the group. So they just burst away. Um, and uh, here's sort of uh, what it looks like, one of these attacks. This is, uh, here we have, you'll see, bang, an attack on the group. Um, and so here is another kind of uh, behavior that also pops out, which is one of great interest, is can we quantify uh, where these attacks are occurring, how frequently, just based on these automated approaches, and for instance, from where uh, the network was attacked, which node um, was the initial responder, and how did that uh, transfer through the rest of the group? Um, and so if we look at that, ah, well, sorry, no, I'll go back. Um, then we can uh, overlay these, these, these color-encoded behavioral states on the group as it moves through the world with the goal ultimately to overlay those on, on the videos and attempt to uh, marry this sort of uh, unsupervised approach, this, this, this uh, statistical breakdown of behavior with behaviors that we can observe and understand. Um, and I think this is the great tension of using this kind of approach uh, to quantify behavior because ultimately it needs a ground truth, but if your uh, intention is to remove remove um, subjectivity from uh, your assessment of behavior, um, it becomes a sort of chicken and egg problem which way around uh, you perform this uh, process. Um, but uh, going back to this, this predator attack, we see here uh, quite an interesting phenomenon where uh, there is this deviation by one individual or some subset of the group from the otherwise uh, overriding group state. And I think these are very, very interesting um, phenomena, um, and we have, of course, many, many instances of these. Um, and so this, for instance, could be uh, an attack on a subset of individuals. Maybe they entered a, a territory here, and the territory holder attacked these individuals, which had to take a, a deviation in the path. Or, of course, it could be the avoidance of an obstacle, and this is another aspect uh, to this whole process. This is occurring in the real world where there are things, there's terrain, there's things to, to, to navigate and, and avoid. And, of course, we can also quantify uh, those things because um, as we move these camera arrays through the world, we're getting a lot of information um, on the structure um, uh, of, the, of the terrain, just as you saw in, in Ari's talk. Um, and using this approach, structure through motion, we can then reconstruct the entire uh, terrain through which these animals moved um, and start to ask questions not only about how they're interacting with one another and how they're interacting with uh, other heterospecific species, but also how they're interacting with the world that they have to navigate. Um, and we can reconstruct the camera path. Sorry about the low frame rate. Uh, it's the cost of uh, rendering these things. Um, uh, and uh, for each one of these um, behavioral traces that we get, um, they're typically about 45 minutes long. We can reconstruct the entire path. Um, typically, we're getting between 250 and 300 meter uh, sort of path lengths. Um, and uh, the really nice thing is that the, the paths often overlap so that we have um, a sort of ground truth so that we know where we are in space. The idea is to combine this with GPS markers, which is not currently uh, uh, achievable underwater, um, so we can reconstruct entire sections uh, of, this, uh, of this terrain in which these animals are living. Um, this gives us 
really, really nice uh, ability to then uh, interrogate how they're dealing with environmental obstacles. So here you see a particularly tall rock and you see a decision point at the level of the group here where some of them went around this way and the rest of them went around this way. And of course, this is happening frequently. What I'd also like to point out, especially in the context of the, the talk we saw um, on the bird flapping uh, yesterday, um, is here we get a similar uh, ability to measure individual tail beats um, by, the, by the tortuosity of the, of the path here. And so you're getting evidence of, of how many tail beats they're doing, the frequency, uh, and can compare that to the speed, uh, for instance, when they're escaping a predator or making a different uh, behavioral decision. Okay, and so now to take it uh, into the evolutionary uh, context. Um, and to bring it back to this point, so we may have uh, alternative mechanisms for differences in social influence. Um, and here, if we're asking uh, questions of a system in which we know that there are differences in the mode of living, we know that there are differences in the degree of sociality, we know that there are differences in the collective structure of these different species, we can then go in and ask the question, over the time of, of evolution that has changed these species, which one of these aspects has changed? Yeah? So we can go in and interrogate the, the, the basic behavioral repertoire that these animals have to ask, has that changed? And that leads to different uh, emergent collective outcomes. Again, to remind you, we could, we could then embed it in a network to ask the question, if the behaviors are the same, is it that they differently uh, transmit through the network and have a different effect on the rest of the group? Or is everything the same, but it's just occurring at different spatial scales? And so to answer this question, again, we look to the cichlids, uh, and this is a particularly special group of, of cichlids in Lake Tanganyika, the Lamprologene cichlids. Um, obviously, if you know anything about cichlids, which you may not, of course, uh, they're famous for this, this uh, explosive adaptive radiation. So we have uh, over a thousand species in the African Rift Lakes, all from a, a known um, uh, founder stock of, of a handful of species that have since diverged into a, a, a wide variety of modes of life. Um, and so this particular group comprises about 40 species. They are all very, very small, so very amenable to, to experimentation and, um, and uh, field manipulation. They all eat the same things, they're microbenthivores. The same things eat them. They all live in snail shells. They're all about the same size. They all look roughly the same, um, but they vary dramatically in their social structure. So some of them live entirely solitarily, except for the breeding uh, condition, and some of them live in permanent social groups with alloparental care, helpers at nest, um, and all of the sort of classic hallmarks of sociality. And so the way these animals interact is fundamentally different, yet everything else about their ecology and life history is relatively conserved. And so that we can then go in and say, given that there are these differences amongst how they interact, what is actually different about them? Um, and here, in, in, in sort of distinction to the stuff I showed you earlier about only the kinematic signatures of, of these swimming schools in the wild, here we're very much interested in the uh, interactions that are occurring between these animals. And so here we have three traces that describe this behavioral interaction. Now, from a traditional ethological perspective, we would look at this interaction and we would uh, characterize this as, a, as an aggressive uh, act on the part of the green fish towards the orange fish, and that might be the end of it. Um, and here we could, we could quantify that. Here we have the, if you can see it, I apologize, it's, it's small and faint. Here we have the speed of the two animals. So we have a rapid increase in the, in the speed of the green animal. Here we have the relative orientation of the two animals. So when it's zero, one animal is facing the other. And here we have the inter-individual distance between them. Um, and so using supervised methods, as I said, and unsupervised methods, we can break down all of these different types of behavior and ask the question, are these behaviors different amongst these different species? Importantly here, we have one of the social species, and what you'll notice is, of course, in the, uh, in the attack, this orange fish is not leaving. It's staying in the territory. Um, it's performing uh, what we probably would interpret as an affiliative display here, a sort of peacekeeping display, um, and it's allowed to stay, which would be very different, we would uh, hypothesize, to the non-social species in which this interaction would lead, uh, with, uh, lead into this fish uh, vacating the area entirely. 
Now, leaning on uh, the, the, the long history of study uh, of this particular group of animals, we have uh, a broad range of uh, approaches to then interrogate this, this question about how the behaviors that they display have evolved. We can take traditional ethogram methods where people have um, categorized behavior into, into these categories, these, these uh, distinct um, uh, behavioral states, which is, of course, potentially hazardous because this is probably uh, much more of a continuum of states. Nevertheless, we have a great deal of uh, uh, evidence for, and, and literature supporting this kind of approach. We can take this and combine it with these, some of these um, uh, objective approaches like TSNI um, to, to create behavioral categories and let the data tell the story about what kind of behavioral categories there are and, and ask how they match with these kind of uh, approaches. And then if we've, com we've constructed these, these, these maps of the behavior, we can go in and ask, are these behavioral maps different amongst the different species using exactly the same parameters, using exactly the same thresholding and, 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 and division amongst states? We can then ask, just as Gordon Berman has done with different uh, species of Drosophila, are the behavioral repertoires that these animals have different, and is that what's causing the difference in their collective function um, uh, at, the, at the level of the group. We can then attempt, if we want, to ground truth some of these behavioral maps in the very, very exhaustive um, ethograms that are produced by many of the groups around the world. And I think this really does encapsulate uh, the, the challenge to this kind of question in the modern era, because here we have an ethogram from one of the groups that studies uh, one of these species, and it contains about 35 behaviors. If we look at another group that studies this species, they'll publish an ethogram with about 20 behaviors. And then you have someone like me coming along and showing a behavioral space or a behavioral map here, which has eight categories. And the real challenge and the question is how do we reconcile these uh, different approaches to asking the question how different are behaviors? This becomes very, very important when we're doing comparative work to ask how the behavioral interactions among species have evolved, because if we're not dealing with the same template, we have a very, very difficult task in comparative uh, work. Now, of course, how I choose to create these different categories is subject to debate and argument, but at least I think in this case, we're dealing with a common set of data and that other people can interrogate and interpret and reevaluate and reanalyze versus this kind of approach where we're going underwater with a clipboard and a pencil and we're putting check marks near the different behavioral categories with no way of really comparing them post hoc. Ah, this is what I wanted to say about that one, if I'm able to, oh dear, sorry. Um, interestingly, when we do train um, models uh, in a supervised way, if we train, you can't see it here, but this is the, the aggressive chase category. If we train one of these models on one of the species in the chase category, and then we apply that predictor to one of the other species, which is identical in size and, and everything I said, it fails. So there's something about the kinematics, it seems, um, that means that the predictor generated in one species does not work in another species, perhaps suggesting that there are fundamental differences in the kinematic structure already, um, or the effect that these things have amongst these different species. Okay, um, now of course, one of the things you can do is create behavioral repertoires, as we saw in the previous example, based on the kinematics of the animals alone. But these are social animals living in collectives, so this doesn't really make sense uh, conceptually because we're interested in the interactions. And so the, the subsequent step, and one thing we're, we're now uh, incorporating into these analyses, is to uh, not only uh, include individual level characteristics, but also uh, these sort of Markov chain approaches. Um, this is a paper um, by Jens Krauser, who's with us here, um, looking at the probability of a behavioral shift um, and then perhaps embedding those in natural uh, social networks to ask not just what the animal is doing, but how does what the animal is doing affect what the other animals around it are doing, um, getting to this fundamental question uh, of these rules of interaction and these rules of influence uh, amongst these different species. Okay, uh, and the final um, uh, aspect that I mentioned was this sort of structural or this spatial question. Because of course, when we're comparing these different species that live naturally at different scales and asking what's different about them, it may be that 
the answer is already there. It's simply that they live at different scales. And if you forced them to live together, you would see that they immediately update their behavioral rules such that uh, they no longer um, show these differences in behavior um, because everything about them converges. And so this is what we tried to ask with this experiment. So we forced these different species to live in this standard uh, sort of spatial world where all of the different uh, uh, shells are, are equally spaced. Um, and so their interaction rate and their spatial relationships are all now identical and asked, do the behaviors remain different or do the behaviors converge on the same behavioral set? Now, of course, this is a lesson in the fact that your study system can be smarter than you are because instead of accepting this condition, what they did was rearrange, sorry about this, uh, the architecture of the tank. So here we have the social species, and instead of leaving the shells where they were, they dug out the shells so that they fell together and then lived in these little couplets. The asocial species did the opposite, in which it chose one shell and then buried all of the other shells around it in the tank so no fish could come anywhere near it. Now, I think this is a really beautiful result, demonstrating this relationship between the spatial structure that the animal produces and is given uh, and the behavior that it uh, 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 produces, and of course, the fact that this is a reciprocal relationship. We asked this same question in the field, and so here we're mapping out the, the sort of interaction space uh, amongst all these individuals um, by, by mapping where they are in space, in, in three-dimensional space, and then characterizing their, their, their home ranges, um, also looking at how they deal with individual shells, um, and then, of course, how the groups uh, and the networks that they produce are arranged in space. Okay, so I'll finish uh, there uh, and, and take your questions. Thank you. <coughs>